Hello class and welcome to week two of Abnormal Psychology. This lecture video will serve the purpose as to reviewing your week two learning activities as well as going over chapters three and four in more thorough um, depth as well as giving you a few tips and pointers that you should look out for in terms of your exam for this week. So let's jump right in. For this week, you'll have, of course, like I mentioned, you'll have an exam, which will be over chapters one and one through four. Um, and it's, uh, of course, it's worth up to 100 points. And uh, it's about 40 questions. I, I, ch I popped into it just to check and see um, if this week was on par in terms of what exactly you're needing uh, for the exam and it is um, so if you don't remember much of chapters one and two be sure to pop into those um, um, PowerPoints and check that out and see um, if there's any information that you need to go back over for that you will also have of course your discussion board post and that of course is uh, 250 words or, or more and responding to two of your classmates. Um, and this one, it'll be over uh, the DSM. Uh, so I think the DSM is really interesting in terms of uh, how, number one specifically, how it's evolved over the years and how it's continuously changing. Um, but I think it's you'll find it interesting whenever you're looking at um, specific disorders and things like that, how they use classifications. Um, to ensure that we are classifying specific mental health disorders in the appropriate ways. So I'm interested to hear your feedback and your thoughts on the DSM um, and the changes and the progress that has, it has made. You'll also have a video over psychiatric diagnosis and interviewing, uh, which I talked a little bit about in your announcement for on yesterday. Um, so this is an interesting little um, supplemental video for you guys to watch in terms of whenever you're, whether you're using the DSM um, to diagnose clients and things like that and how that process is um, used. So let's jump right in to the material. So let's start with chapter three. There's quite a bit of information to cover. Um, and like I mentioned, I, I don't like to have really long lecture videos because I know you guys are really busy. Um, but this one might take a little bit of time. So let's jump right into chapter three. Chapter three will be over um, contemporary frameworks. So you'll be talking about Freud um, and you know his theories and um, and how you know the mind is develops and things like that. You'll also be talking about um, conditioning. Um, and there's quite a few few. Um, instances of conditioning that scientists and psychologists use um, that we use today in terms of conditioning and how we are um, and what we learn from observing those um, studies. So um, number one topic of discussion is Freud. Uh, Freud seemingly is some called the father of psychology. Um, many believe uh, a lot of his theories um, today aren't as, um, I guess, widely used today, I want to say. Um, however, some of his thoughts were really good in terms of development and things like that and how um, the state of the mind is. So we'll, with Freud, you'll talk a lot about the unconscious mind and nature of the mind. And that's one of the things that um, you should look out for in terms of for your exam, because I know um, there's going to be questions about the unconscious mind and um, the iceberg and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we dive deeper into the material. So his basic features of the theory is of course unconscious mind and conscious mind and his his whole process of thought and development on unconscious mind is that we as humans we have so many unconscious thoughts and feelings and it's ultimately is the motivation and can be stemmed from the root of abnormal behavior. Um, he believes that we have unresolved sexual conflict. Um, and another hot topic um, that a lot of people talk about is his oldable conflict. Um, and this is basically his belief that that um and it's also called the oedipus complex if you know um ancient greek history you know who oedipus is 
Um, but it's basically his, you know, his thought process on the, his theory of, you know, psychosexual stages in the development and a child's feelings and desires for mainly the opposite sex of a parent. So, for instance, if it's a little boy, he believes that um, the child has these unconscious and unresolved sexual um, feelings for their the opposite sex parent and they of course they act in jealousy and anger towards uh, the same sex parent so you can see this and specifically say for instance if it's a little girl um they may have from freud's view they may have some sexual feelings toward the father and they are um, very jealous of the mom and they want all the attention for the dad and this was Freud's thought process in terms of how little kids are developing in their and within their psychosexual stages, and they, in turn, grow up out of this um, Oedipal conflict. But as you can see from what you hear in terms of the Oedipal conflict, why people have so many doubts about this theory and those beliefs. Um, but it's definitely interesting. Um, that many, 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 many years ago, this is what Freud thought um, in terms of why children act the way they do and how they develop um, and how they uh, deal with their unresolved quote unquote sexual conflict and what um, the unconscious mind develops into what is now known as abnormal behavior. So, moving on. So I don't want to spend too much time um, on anxiety and mechanism of defense because I'm sure by now you guys know a lot about um, mechanisms, mechanisms of defense. So there's repression, so suppressing the, um, the feelings and emotions, reaction formation, so reacting to that information, isolation, isolating yourself, displacement um, is placing yourself in a different uh, mindset or thought process and projecting and that's projecting those feelings onto someone else um, okay so Freud is really known for um, his theory of mind and higher order abstraction so you'll hear a lot about the id the ego and the super ego um, and these are the main tenets that Freud discussed as what in turn um, happens whenever you are um, you have unconscious thoughts and unconscious feelings. So the id is basically the unconscious. And that is what um, controls, you know, impulses. Also, he mentioned that this is, you know, where the main source of all psychic energy um, making, this is the primary component of someone's personality. Um, and this is the only component that is that of the soma's personality that is present from birth. Um, this is what he believes um, the aspect of personality is entirely unconscious and includes instinctive and primitive behaviors. So this is what he believes basically is driven by the pleasure principle, which strives for immediate gratification of all desires, wants, and needs. Um, and this is the early stage of your unconscious thought and feeling. Um, and if he says that if these needs are not satisfied immediately, the results is a state of anxiety or tension. And that's when we talked about how, um, you know, the, the, the previous slide in terms of the mechanism of defense. And that's what happens whenever those feelings, thoughts, and unconscious desires are not met. Um, that is basically the summary of what the it is so moving on to the ego the ego is predominantly conscious so this is what you operate on specifically in your uh daily life and you're in this conscious thought and and it it's this it's kind of like a balancing effect of your reason and logic um freud talks about how the ego is developed from the, at the id and it also ensures that the impulses of it can be expressed in a manner acceptable in the real world. So we talked about before how the id was these impulses and it needs to be met immediately. Um, but they are part of the unconscious 
quote unquote abnormal thoughts and abnormal behaviors. However, the ego presents those thoughts and desires in a more appropriate, appropriate, appropriate and acceptable uh, way to the real world. Um, the ego functions as you know the conscious and the preconscious and unconscious mind. However, it does act um, more consciously in terms of uh, normal behavior and normal thought process. And the ego is a component of personality that is reasonable for dealing with reality. Um, so think about that in terms of whenever you are thinking about id, ego, and superego, which one will operate in modern day real world and have real world, um, um, I guess, reason and logic. And, you know, he also mentions that the ego operates based on the reality principle. principle. Um, so previously before with the id, that operated off of pleasure principle. So you see the correlation between the two and the, th the thought process of this, his thinking. Um, so that reality principle is it strives to satisfy the id desires in a realistic, real, realistic and socially appropriate ways. Um, so yeah, it's similar to, uh, you know, how you, you make a pro and cons list or you are uh, weighing the costs and benefits of each action um, before you just jump into your impulses. Um, so in many cases, this is kind of like delayed gratification. However, you are operating at a level where you are able to listen to your reason and your logic in this case. And a lot of times when people say, for instance, someone over overreacts or argument ensues a lot of people sit would say in a psych world that you're operating off of your id um, level of your Freud unconscious mind so moving on to the super ego uh, and of course this is the last component of the personality to develop um, and Freud talks about how it operates between both conscious and unconscious um, and it delves into your inhibitions so the superego begins to emerge around the age of five. So mind you, Freud has this psychosexual levels of development. So this, at this point, you are developed in terms of after the age of five, in terms of how you can operate between your conscious and unconscious mind. The superego holds, um, I want to say the internalized moral standards and ideas. Uh, that we acquire from our parents and our society. Um, so it's our develop. We develop our sense of right and wrong. Um, it also provides, you know, the guidelines for making sound judgments. And I think that the id and superego are are similar. However, the superego has more um, development in terms of making judgment um, further to design. Um, um, satisfy your desires, your wants and needs on a, um, on a rational level, um, as well as, um, on a judgmental level. But yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, I know that was a quick run through of the it ego, super ego, if you want a little more detail in terms of that, but I think I covered mainly the key components of these three of uh, theories of the mind that So let's move on to the next slide. The iceberg. Um, so this is a, another important component for you to look out for in terms of the exam. And it's overall a very important um, model framework in terms of what you think of when you think of the id, the ego, and the superego in terms of Freud. So Freud shaped the the id, ego, and superego into this vision of the iceberg. And whenever you're thinking about in terms of which level each one is, think of an iceberg. The id um, is your your unconscious psychic energy and it's covered. No one can see it. No one can think about it but you. And you are in control of that. It's out of the way. It's hidden from the world to see. Superego. Um, 
it is of course internalized ideals but it also operates in terms of being in tune with reality and um normal quote-unquote normal behavior so that's why it's under the scenes of from the world to see however you are still able to uh, use that um, whenever you are in certain situation and it operates it operates off of the pre-conscious mind so it's outside of awareness but it's accessible um, to you and then lastly you have the ego um, and that is what is of course the conscious mind um, and that's something that people can see and it's an outward uh, appearance of your thoughts and your feelings um, and, and of course it's the executive mediator between uh, the two, the ego, uh, I mean the id and the super ego. So this is just a great model for you to look back to in case you're wondering um, what um, what each level is. So let's see. Oh, another theory, um, of course, with Freud is we talked about his stages of psychosexual development um, in terms of um, a child developing um, his thoughts, feelings, emotions, but he also talks about the, um, the specific age uh, ranges for these things. The first age range is oral, so we'll talk a little bit more about that, and I'll I'll dive into what exactly each stage is. So starting with the oral, um, Freud believed that the oral stage was about the birth um, until about up until 18 months. Um, in this first stage of specifically personality development, the libido is centered up on the baby's mouth. Um, and of course it gets much satisfaction from putting things and all objects into their mouth to satisfy their, their id demands. Um, so at this stage, of course, you'll see babies wanting um, toys in their mouth, their hands, things like that. Um, and it's oriented around, you know, sucking, biting, uh, specifically in terms of breastfeeding. Um, so oral stimulation could be uh, stimulated in their, I guess you would say their id, thoughts, feelings, and desires to, uh, as a need to feel wanted, loved, and things like that. So the next stage is your anal stage. Um, so as a caveat, I do want to mention that some of these um, these thoughts that Freud's have, like I mentioned before, are very, um, not off-putting, but very interesting. So I do want to make a caveat of that before I talk a little bit more about these specific stages. So the anal stage is between the ages of 18 months and age three. Um, so as I mentioned before, the libido and the motivation um, is now focused on the anus. Um, so the child is fully aware that they are, you know, a person and they own the right that their wishes, um, they are able to poop and pee and do all those things on their own. Um, so, and Freud believed that, of course, this is the, the start of the potty training in which the um, adult, um, impulses for a child to be more self-sufficient in terms of pooping, peeing, and things like that. Um, so, and of course there's more discussion about the pleasure principle. Um, he goes on to say, you know, how pleasurable pooping and things like that may be for a child, but of course, uh, like I mentioned before, that is just how Freud thought, um, in terms of, uh, pleasure and psychosexual, um, uh, development. So let's move on to the phallic stage. This he believes was from ages three to six. Um, so at this stage, sensitivity now becomes concentrate, concentrated in genitals. Um, and oftentimes he says that, um, the genital area becomes a source of new source of pleasure. Um, so you may see a child at this stage, um, quote unquote, uh, masturbating I would say it wouldn't be they don't really know what that 
specifically is, but you may see that they are more inclined to be touching themselves. Um, and they become more aware of their sexual differences between, say, for instance, um, a little girl and a little boy, uh, which in, in set, turns in motion their, um, their Oedipus complex, as he mentioned, and for a little girl's a lecture complex. Um, so, and this is the result in, in the process of, uh, of identification um, and adapting their characteristics of their same-sex parent. Um, so, and I think that if you're not thinking in terms of uh, a sexual side of it, you can think back to maybe, um, you know, how little kids are like, like, uh, noticing the different changes of their body versus maybe their classmate or their friend or something like that. So, um, I know I, I try to take the sexual components out of it. Uh, for me personally, because I can't, um, it's hard to relate to uh, that part of it. But I think Freud was on to um, some great points when he, he he's mentioning how the development in terms of the psychosexual development of a child and how it changes whenever they are going through these specific stages in their lives. Um, they're starting to notice their, their body parts and things like that. Um, but yes. So let's move on to the latency stage. The latency stage, as Troy mentioned, is from age six to puberty. Um, so at this point, he mentions that there's no further psychosexual development taking place during this stage. Um, so it's latent, and it means that it's it's hidden from um, specifically from the child, and their libido is dormant, as he mentions. Um, he also thought that most sexual impulses are repressed during this latent stage and sexual energy can be, um, uh, I guess, eliminated. Um, so in terms of they'll have defense mechanisms towards work, school, and hobbies and friendships. Um, so their energy is channeled through developing new skills and acquiring knowledge. Um, and their plague is largely confined to um, you know, playing with children of the same gender. So moving to the genital stage. So this is, of course, puberty on into adulthood. Um, and this is, of course, Freud's last stage of their psychosexual theory of personal development. Um, and it, it begins in puberty. Um, and it's at the time where adolescents, um, adolescent, I want to say, sexual experimentation and understanding um, and he mentions that it's a successful resolution of which is setting or settling down into a loving one-on-one -on -one relationship with another person so this is when they are geared more towards having those um, long-lasting relationships so from that I know it's a lot to talk about it's his process and his, his thought process and of course his thought process on development of psychosexual development is not the same as others um and we'll probably talk a little bit more about that but just to give you a background on that okay let's move a little bit faster just in case we are i don't want to create a 45 minute lecture video but i do want to talk on um a few components that you'll need to know for the exam and this has a lot of slides so we'll talk a lot about behavioral approaches and um, operant conditioning and things like that and behaviorism and if you've taken intro to psych there this might be a refresher for you um, Ivan Pavlov uh, is key in the behavioral approaches John Watson um, and also little Albert um, and the little Albert experiments is definitely interesting. Um, John Watson discuss, uh, discusses a lot about conditioning with Albert, but I'll give you a brief little overview. Um, but do please do watch the lecture the, uh, the little video that is entailed with it because it gives uh, some great background information. So little Albert was a little boy. Um, he was inherently um, trained to be scared of uh, a little rat. So, so essentially he was a controlled experiment um, and it's 
sad to say that these little experiments on children back in the day, um, it breaks my little heart because I'm sure still to this day he is still scared of um, objects. And I think there's there was even an article about him being in his adult life scared um, of rats and even bunny rabbits any white animal he was scared of but i um i go on a tangent but let me finish with uh explaining this so basically it was a study that um it wanted to show um classical conditioning in humans so basically the child was placed into a little room um and he was trained to become afraid of this rat so what they did was every time the the rat would come into the room um, a little small little white rat would come into the room they would counteract it with a loud um, scary noise um, so they introduce a neutral stimulus which is specifically the, the, the white rat they counteracted it with an unconditioned stim stimulus um, so that is the loud noise. Um, and then of course the reaction that the child gave, which is an unconditioned response is fear. So in turn, they continued this process over and over and over again. And the child synonymously, synonymously equated the loud noise with the rat. Um, so, and that's when your conditioning was developed. So every time you saw a white, small white object, he would be scared. Um, and that continued on into his adulthood life, um, unfortunately. Um, but that just goes to show how research was conducted back then and how it not, should not be the, uh, to this day, however. Um, but yeah, so that's definitely an interesting video I want you guys to check out in terms of conditioning. Um, let me see if there's anything else I want to talk to you about. just to go off my checklist in terms of what you need for your exam. So of course we talked about unconscious mind, iceberg metaphor, um, subject is distress and research design that's more along the lines of chapters one and two. Um, you'll need to know of course about DSM accesses and some information about that. Um, Freud, um, operant and classical conditioning. Um, and neurons and neurotransmitters. So let's see if there's anything else on this slide. Um, of course, no. I think that's pretty much all I want to talk to you about from this slide. Um, yeah. So let's move on to chapter four. And I won't spend too much time on this because, like I said, I've already gone way over from what I was wanting to talk about. Uh, okay, so in terms of chapter four, of course, you'll need to know it, it's more along the lines of classification, diagnosis, and assessment. Um, so in terms of classification, you'll learn more about the DSM um, and how um, mental health disorders increase by 50%. Uh, homosexuality is discussed in the DSM, however, it is not in the DSM anymore. And I think that's definitely um, um, conducive to how society felt about homosexuality back in the day. They felt it as it was a mental health disorder, um, and it's not. Um, so thankfully, that was removed from the DSM. Um, Rosenhand, I know this is definitely something you'll need to know for your exam. <coughs> um, so I guess I'll talk a little bit about Rosenhan, um, but the main area of focus, of course, is the DSM for this specific chapter. So David Rosenhan, uh, he was an American psychologist. He is best known for his Rosenhan experiment. Um, it, and it, it was a study that challenged the validity of psych psychiatry diagnoses. Um, so subsequently the research cast huge doubt on you know experiments veracity and outcomes um so his rosenhan experiment in 1973 it failed to detect fake patients so the main gist of 
this experiment was to con basically, like I said, to to examine the validity of psychiatric diagnoses. And his study was about eight parts. Um, so the first part, of course, it included the use of quote unquote healthy um, associates. So they were called the pseudo patients. There's three women and five men, including Rosenhan himself. He introduced himself into the the the, the study. Um, so they briefly um, showed um, symptoms of fakely um, showed symptoms of hallucinations in order to as an attempt to gain admission into 12 psychiatric hospitals in five states in the United States. Um, so all of them were admitted, of course, and diagnosed with psychiatric disorders. Um, after they were admitted, um, the patients act normally and, you know, told the staff they that they felt fine um, and they no longer experienced any additional hallucinations. So at that point, they all were forced to admit to having a mental illness and had to agree to take uh, anti-psychotic anti drugs as a condition of the release. Um, so, of course, the average time that all patients spent in the hospital was 19 days, um, but all of them but one were diagnosed with schizophrenia and remission before the release. So this whole study was, of course, like to see how the process went. Um, and of course, the classification of uh, you know, development of um, psychiatric disorders, they, the hospitals fail to, to detect fake patients, um, which is scary. Um, but this, like I said, this was back in 1973. So this was definitely an interesting study um, in terms of improving the process of classification because there's many people um, currently today that have these disorders and diagnoses that aren't... Um, accurate um so if this is still going on today and i think that when you hear when people say they have i have ocd ptsd bipolar schizophrenia i have all these disorders that is not an accurate diagnosis um there's no way that you can have five different um categories of a diagnosis there has to be you can have anxiety and you can have depression um, but there's a certain level that needs to be explored because as you can see some of these diagnoses they do have an overlap so i think more research and studying needs to go on in terms of some of these hospitals that are diagnosing multiple um, but i know i go off on a tangent again but um i just think this study was so interesting and it's so helpful in terms of helping the process of identifying mental health disorders so the second part of the study um this also identify patients as possible pseudo patients. Um, so the second part of the study was involved um, at, at a hospital um, administration process, challenging um, Rosenhan to send, of course, pseudo patients to, to its facility um, to where the staff would detect um, mental health disorders. So. In this study, Rosenhan agreed and in the following weeks of about 193 new patients and staff identified 41 as potential pseudo patients. So it was the exact opposite of the first study. So he told these hospitals, you're going to have fake patients coming in um, instead of going in blindly. Um, so and out of the those those hospitals that he told, they identified 41, um, 193 patients, they identified 41 as pseudo patients, um, and with two of these receiving suspicion from at least one psychiatrist and one other staff members. When in fact, uh, Rosen had no pseudo patients to the hospital. So this process was geared towards you know, having the the doctors be more specific in terms of their uh, reviewing process, and he had zero fake patients, and they identified 41 out of 193. So it's just definitely, like I said, it's so interesting in terms of how 
the process is withheld. Um, so I definitely think that there's so much more room to grow and to learn from this study because there are some cases in where a misdiagnosis and this is just not only for you guys but for anybody that you may know if you ever are you or a family member or a friend is ever diagnosed with something that they believe they do not have please 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 get a second um a second opinion um just for your own health and safety and your friends and family so that's just a little um i guess suggestion from me so moving on uh the dsm so the main thing i want to talk about in terms of dsm is the axes um and the axes are basically the classification system um, that the uh, diagnostic um, manual uses. So axis one is the basically the determination of a clinical disorder. Um, and this classification system, the axis is fairly new. I want to say it started in about um, 2000s, maybe. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. But um, so the access one, of course, is clinical disorder. So that is the information. So that's your um, your personality disorders, that's your behavioral disorders, um, substance disorders, uh, mood, anxiety. So that's the name of the classification or uh, the specific clinical disorder group that it is in. So and then you have your access two. Um, it's more geared towards your, your personality disorders. So um, and things like that so you'll that's where you'll have your um paranoid personality disorder you'll have your antisocial you have your borderline you have your histrionic narcissist personality disorder avoidant um and and mental re retardation is also in that um category as well so and then you have your access three um and so this is where your general general medical conditions um that are act that are relevant to access one and two will be listed um so this will be of course medical conditions that were present which may impact the patient's um um the management of the disorder or their mental health disorder in general um so that's um copd um um sometimes um I want to say cancer or uh, HIV, AIDS, um, hepatitis C, those mental health or those medical conditions that can have an impact on um, the um, your mood, things like that. Um, that's where that is listed. Um, Access 4 is used um, to describe your psychosocial environment and environmental problems. So that is your home life, your school life, uh, maybe a work um, issue. Um, so things that could be included here, educational problems, housing problems, economic problems, um, public uh, problems with access to health care. Um, what else? What else? What else? Um, issues within the social environment. Um, problems with your support group. So whether you have a divorced family, um, you are living in a low SES um, population, um, things like that. And then you have your access five. And this is basically um, your global assessment of functioning is what they call it. But it's a rating scale that um, it goes from zero to a hundred. And the, the nickname for it is GAF. Um, and it, it provides a way to summarize in a single number just how well the person is functioning over, overall. Um, so when I worked at a, a in New Jersey at a mental health hospital, we used this a lot. Um, and a lot of times you'll see a patient come in with, say, for instance, an uh, overall functioning of uh, 30. Um, so if they have anxiety, if they have depression, they're, they're not doing so well. Um, and then once they leave the, the inpatient program, they are functioning more at, I want to say, maybe a 60 or 70. Um, so you'll see that change within your um, diagnosis. Um, so that is the only one that could possibly change. You can also have access um, for change a little bit too as well. Um, but just to, just to give you a, a basis of uh, what the 
GAF level of functioning is, is so you'll have your 100 will be no symptoms, 90 will be minimal symptoms with good functioning, 80 will be transient symptoms that are expected uh, reactions to psychosocial stressors, um, 70 will be mild symptoms or some difficulty in social, occupational, at, or school functioning, um, 60 will be moderate symptoms or um, I want to say moderate difficulty in social occupation or school functioning. Uh, 50 serious symptoms or any serious impairment in social occupation or school functioning. Um, and 40, of course, some impairment in reality testing or communication or a major impairment in several areas such as work, school, family relations, judgment, thinking, and mood, um, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so, and when thinking in terms of number 10, persistent danger of severely hurting themselves or others or persistent inability to maintain minimal personal hygiene or serious suicidal act with clear expectations of death. Um, so that the lower numbers are definitely more for your um, severely sick patients, your suicidal patients, um, and things like that. So that's just a basis of uh, background information on the GAF and the accesses. Okay. Uh, I don't think I want to spend that much more time talking. I've already gone 15 minutes over <laughs> what I wanted to talk about. But I really hope you, this, got, this um, lecture video was helpful for you all. Um, because, like I said, it's so much information within the two chapters, but it's very important information. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Diagnostic processes. No, I don't think there's anything else. Of course, there's um, psychological testing, um, the Rorschach test. Um, you've probably heard of that. There's, of course, you do need to know the difference between um, CAT scan, MRI, PET scan, um, and functional MRI. That will be on the exam. So, of course, you know that um, those specific um, test and their functioning and what they do is very important for the exam and as well as your overall information. Um, let's see. Yep, and that's it. Like I said, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please feel free to reach out to me. I hope this lecture video was helpful for you guys. I know I told you last week I wanted to be more in depth, and this is way more in depth. Um, so I'll probably keep it short next week as well. But just for your your uh, listening pleasure. I hope it was helpful. Um, and if you have any questions, comments, concerns about any of the material, I'm free to discuss it in more detail. Um, just let me know. And I hope you guys have a great week. And I'll talk to you later.